everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today, Psychedelics Weekly. Kyle Buller here, actually calling in from Breckenridge, Colorado at Joe's Place. Um, and really excited to have Diego Pinzon on the show, first time. But Diego has been working with us for quite a while um, in the background, so it's, I'm really excited to, to have you on, Diego. Can you give a little bit of an introduction on uh, who you are and some of your work? Hey, Kyle. Uh, thanks for having me really excited uh, for this uh, episode. I'll give a brief introduction to myself. Well, first of all, I work for Psychedelics Today. I'm one of the main instructors and facilitators of the VITAL program. I do a few things in the background, uh, also working for other programs like our future VITAL Oregon as well. A bit about my history. Um, I was born in Colombia, Bogota, Colombia. I live in Australia currently. I did an undergrad in psychology here in Australia. Then I did a master's in transpersonal psychology in Sofia University. This is in Palo Alto, California. When I was there, I volunteered as a research assistant to develop some microdosing studies. Uh, From there, I worked in a couple of Australian organizations in psychedelics, one of them being the Psyche Institute. They are going to do some research with an Australian version of ayahuasca, so I I helped them develop the the entire treatment model for this. Currently, aside from psychedelics today, I have the honor of being one of the researchers in Australia's first psilocybin trial. This is for depression and anxiety associated with a terminal illness. Uh, it's really study. exciting. Yeah, this, it's, it's great. <laughs> I'm really, really happy to, to be part of this. Yeah, so th- thanks a lot for having me. And yeah, let's, let's talk about this news. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for all your work. And it's, um, you know, it's always fun to think about our history, too, because I think you took like one of our first navigating psychedelics classes when we originally launched it in like 2017. And you were very groffy and oriented. And we're like, we really like this guy. He's he's really fascinating. And then, um, yeah, we just always stay in contact. And you're always doing some really cool stuff. And yeah, getting associated with the the research and everything. And um, you've just been such a huge help uh, and vital. So I can't thank you enough for for being part of it and being in the background and um, also being an instructor too. Um, how's that been for you, Be, like being a study group instructor? Because you have a, a class actually in 40 minutes here. So yeah. um, I, have, I have a class very soon. And yeah, th- thanks for acknowledging that. Um, I glossed over my personal details and interests, but um, huge into growth transpersonal psychology, as well as somatic um psychology and this is something i learned at sophia which we call embodied spirituality Mm -hmm. Um, so that's what i'm really into so the study group uh not gonna lie the the study was intimidating because it's uh we have one australian and there all the other students were american so i love getting to know people from other countries other professions We have doctors, we have psychiatrists, we have uh, psychotherapists, we have alternative practitioners, we have people who are just interested in psychedelics and want to learn learn more in in just in a very formal and structured way as we do in VITAL. Um, Did I mention we have some underground people as well? So we have like this group where all these different views come together and we can discuss, learn from each other, uh, learn different perspectives. Uh, I've been learning a lot. I love listening to different people. I think everyone has really enjoyed all all the conversations. So I think it's been a personal journey of not just knowing myself and how I interact with others, but also a personal journey for others as they listen to people from different walks of of life. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, thanks for being part of it. So let's dig in. I know we have some limited time here today. Um, So you're on the ground in Australia, and you've been kind of um, associated with different groups, and there is this really interesting news that came out, what, last week on February 3rd that was published by the Australian government that they are changing um, the classification of psilocybin and MDMA to enable prescribing by authorized psychiatrists. Um, And I think we were at canadelic when we first heard this news so i didn't really get too much time to to explore it but 
that seemed really huge that, you know, Australia is one of the um, you know first countries to uh, change the, the drug classification. But they're um, specifically taking psilocybin and MDMA and it'll be listed as a Schedule 8. So that'll be a con- controlled drug and um, medicine. Um, but any other activity outside of the kind of prescription will still be Schedule 9 um, as a prohibited substance. But that was really interesting news. How are you feeling about it? And just being on the ground there in, in um, Australia and maybe hearing some thoughts about you or maybe some colleagues, um, maybe you've been having some conversations, just to, kind of curious to hear how, how you guys are perceiving all this news. Yeah, so it's very unprecedented. Um, it's also really exciting. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how what they announced and how how it's going to work. But everyone in the field has been really busy and I think it took a lot of people by surprise. Just to give you an example, um, the TGA, it's the Australian equivalent of the FDA, is the Therapeutics Good Administration and they're in charge of scheduling substances. So in Australia, our schedule is, you will like reversed. So the highest number, which is um, Schedule 9 prohibited substances, the, the most illegal wild one, Schedule 1, will be the most available. Uh, mm-hmm. So MDMA and psilocybin uh, were rescheduled from Schedule 9 prohibited substances to Schedule 8 controlled medicines. This means that um, authorized prescribers are going to be able to prescribe this uh, MDMA and psilocybin, assuming, let's assume that it's going to be synthetic um, psilocybin for many reasons. Um, I think just the fact that it's called a prescription, it's already raises some questions because it's not just a medicine that you give someone and take home and and use, um, you know, use in their own time. Um, yeah, the example I wanted to give was, I remember when I lived in Sydney back in maybe 2015. Around that time, only then the TGA considered that hemp seeds uh, were okay to eat and were edible. Wow. So That's ima- wild. Imagine, imagine that. <laughs> um, it's a huge jump. Um, what do you think helped fast track this? Because I remember a few, like a year ago, they shot this down when MMA was trying to do some stuff. Um, but, you know, have there been more advocates on the ground really kind of pushing for this? Have they been listening to people's stories? Like, do you know, like what really kind of jump started this? That's that's really hard to tell. I imagine more people uh, in the community started writing letters, but... It's really strange. It's 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 very unprecedented. I think it's been intense, intense lobbying, and yeah, I don't want to comment too much too much on that because yeah. it was clearly not a decision based on a huge amount of evidence. We know the evidence for psilocybin. Uh, you know, it's 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 very limited, and we, we can talk about that. For MDMA, we got phase three, which uh, which is good, mm-hmm. but also we need to you know. Uh, realize that these medicines don't, or substances, they don't work for everyone. We don't know exactly what are the factors that predict outcomes. A lot of this research uh, just has uh, just hasn't been done. Um, one of the call it caveats of this decision is that you need to be an authorized uh, prescriber to to be able to work with these substances. To be an authorized prescriber, you need to be approved by a human research ethics committee or the uh, your relevant college, which would be the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists. Hmm. Um, as far as I know, this organization opposes the rescheduling. So you will have to go through a human research ethics committee. The psychiatrist doctor who is going to work with these substances has to develop uh, a protocol. The protocol will need to be approved. The TGA will also have to be approved this application, and they will have to source the the substance, uh, you know, from from an unapproved approved pharmacy or. Uh, I kind of like got a kick out of that in this um, <clears throat> this document. They said, yeah. However, this amendment will allow uh, authorized psychiatrists to access and legally supply 
uh, specified uh, quote unapproved medicine containing these substances to patients under their care for so it got me like unapproved you know like yeah because there's no pharma pharma companies like creating this where is it going to come from and i don't know i just kind of laughed at that unapproved thing i'm like is this is this going to be legal to just like get something off the street <laughs> you know because it's it's saying like yeah medicine containing these substances and i find that to be kind of curious language as well um, and they say that right in the beginning right like um from July 1st this year, medicines containing psychedelic substances, psilocybin and MDMA, can be prescribed specifically uh, by specifically authorized psychiatrists. Um, and it makes me wonder, too, like, you know, what's the play here? Are they going to be really focused on the psychotherapy aspect, or is this just going to be kind of like, um, I'm, we're going to give you this medicine and, and, you know, hopefully you kind of self treat, or maybe they do have some protocols, but maybe it's not so fixated on the psychotherapy. And I think it was Rick Doblin, um, in a time article that I was just reading beforehand. Um, you know, that's what he was emphasizing too. It's like, you know, how are they going to roll this out? And the emphasis isn't on the substance from the maps perspective right the emphasis is on the therapeutic perspective the therapy the relationship um and so i'm curious to know like yeah what protocols are they gonna like provide and you know is therapy going to be part of this i would hope so um and i hope they kind of take in consideration of all the research that has been happening that's been based around the therapy um but yeah i guess we probably don't know that um it's probably still to be determined yeah you raised a really important point and in my view, in my opinion, the, these health experts don't really know how to work with these substances. The general public don't really know. I think the lobbying group has been pushing these substances as a, a medicine that will cure everything, like panacea. <laughs> you, right. you, you'll, you'll take it and you'll go through the course and then it will just work for everyone. Um, the therapy, we have protocols established for clinical research, uh, as you know, but there's, here we have no universal approved protocol for treatment that's that ha- just hasn't been established uh, right. <clears throat> in Australia. The reality is that in Australia, we don't have the, quote, infrastructure to develop, um, to roll out these treatments. There's mm-hmm. no, we don't have guidelines for training, for example. Uh, Rick Dublin uh, commented and said that we have no adequate training either for people. Yeah. As as we know, uh, the therapy is the main the main component of you know using treatment with psychedelic substances. So there's too many questions. There's too many unknowns. They're giving people there's less than six months until this becomes a reality. Uh, why are psychiatrists authorized? Because we come from the mentality that they are the people prescribing medicines, but a lot of them are not trained in psychotherapy. Um, and not even in any therapeutic approach that will be similar to what we use in the paradigms of psychedelic therapy. We have to realize we're speaking about something completely different to the biomedical understanding of illness and even just the standard psychological view. Almost makes me wonder, like, you know, we're, we're putting this in the medical framework and medical model. Um, and... I think about like say the the adult use model that's coming out of Oregon that's more community centered, right? And we're talking about the importance of the therapy, but I also would love to emphasize the importance of the community and the container. Um, and maybe that's not you know psychotherapy all the time, right? But you have a tight container of somebody watching f- out for you. You're developing like that relationship. You have um, that trust there, and, and maybe they are trained a little bit to help people to go back inward and and uh, really provide that container. But just thinking about like here with like Spervato as ketamine, right? They have a protocol. You go to the doctors and, um, you know, it doesn't sound like it's in conjunction with psychotherapy. You go to the office, you get it, you hang out and then, and then you leave. Um, and so it's just interesting. Like, yeah, I'm just curious to see like how this unfolds, like what type of model unfolds here in, in Australia. Um, and you know, maybe the limits of psychiatry, right? Cause most psychiatrists aren't, also trained in, in a lot of psychotherapy. I mean, I have 
some colleagues that, that did go on to get some of that training, but I also have colleagues that, you know, didn't really get a lot of you know, like psychotherapy training in, in their, their medical training. And so like, it, it, yeah, it's just interesting. I get it from that perspective that, you know, doctors have the prescribing right and um, they should be able to prescribe it, but also like, yeah, are we thinking then what, <laughs> right? Like what, what is yeah. the container in which these people are using this in? And, you know, Rick Doblin, I think did mention that in that time article. Um, and I think the time article was just uh, psychedelics may be here faster than we know it or something along those lines. <clears throat> um, and he was saying, you know, the world's watching, right? And there will be ripple effects. And so if Australia rolls this out and it doesn't go well, that could have ripple effects in, in a possibly negative way. Um, so I don't know. Do you have any concerns or have you have you talked to anybody that's like having concerns around this rollout or? Yeah, actually, last night, the Australian Psychedelic Society hosted an expert panel discussion and they had researchers there, the uh, psychiatrists and a lot of people are very concerned. That's that's the reality among people who work in the field and whom I consider authorities and experts in psychedelics. Uh, everyone is, is really worried as to how this will be um, rolled out and the community expectations, also accessibility. Um, in a clinical trial here in Australia, quoting uh, Stephen Bright, who's the first researcher to ever give MDMA to someone in Australia in a trial, uh, he quoted twenty thousand dollars per um per session or per participant wow. i believe uh, which is around f maybe four fourteen thousand us um yeah so that's yeah that's the other thing i guess we haven't really brought up here with this rollout too yeah the accessibility um you know how much is it going to cost and again are there any pharma companies that are like producing these substances yet i'm sure you know th they probably will step in and produce it but yeah what's the drug cost right and then the therapeutic costs and everything. Um, yeah, I have no doubt a lot of uh, pharmaceutical companies are going to jump in. Uh, the Something that's a bit sad, of course, a lot of these companies and people pushing for this, the rescheduling, they never discuss decriminalization. Right. Uh, and when this is not spoken about, I think it just reinforces the the tragedy that is the war on drugs and this this failed <laughs> failed policy that's you know it's killing people every day and where, where i come right. from 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 latin america right um so yeah i would like to encourage everyone involved in the field she'll be she'll be pushing for for decrim um yeah 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 you know, access, hopefully community stepping in, kind of creating um, their, their containers. And then, you know, I, I, I think I, I go towards legalization at times, just especially when it comes to synthetics, just safer supplies, right? Or just kind of knowing um, what you're getting. <clears throat> and, you know, there's just a lot of like weird stuff out there um, nowadays, even in like legal markets, right? A um, lot of like crazy hemp, CBD, THC, you know, eight Delta 8 products that are floating out there that aren't regulated and um, I don't know yeah I, I always get a little sketched out by that too so there is part of me that like kind of th likes that regulation where I'm like you know I'd really like to know what I'm getting and it, it's yeah. like you know it's safe um, versus it being such a, a you know renegade show but I also get that too like especially when it comes to organic substances like mushrooms where you could grow it it's like okay like you, the fuck up there is that you know, you have contamination, you have mold um, with mm -hmm. cannabis too, right? And, you know, I think that th that's what came with uh, legalization is that, you know, sometimes you get those readouts, right? They're, they're doing they're doing testing um, on it. Um, but, you know, I think for plants, yeah, why not decriminalize it and allow people to grow it and um, have access to it? Exactly, I agree. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Well, yeah, I don't know. Anything else you want to share around Australia? I mean, this just came, at, it felt like it came out of left field because there was like all this movement, all this movement, and then all of a sudden it felt like it died off. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm opening up and hearing this news. I'm like, where the hell did that come from? Like, that, that's pretty wild. So on some hand, it's like really exciting, right? It's like, oh my gosh, like, you know, how progressive that is when it seemed like it was never really going to change um and you know hearing you and, and some other people from australia just talk about how like you know conservative it, it can be especially around drug laws and then having like a change like this it um you know it seems like a, a really huge deal too yeah huge huge deal um yeah people in australia who are listening to this 
Uh, know that there's people in the background working uh, to prepare some accredited training. Uh, I think it will it will take some time because it has to be done properly. Um, a lot of people are inquiring about about training. How how can I you know I'm a psychiatrist. What can I do? Um, be patient. News news will be out. Uh, yeah. The top so will the, the will there be like a board putting all that together? Kind of like what we're seeing in Oregon, where they'll have like the board approve curriculum and development and kind of uh, yeah. Yeah, we are hoping that an organization called the APRA, uh, Australian Health Practitioners Agency, will develop some guidelines, hopefully, and I think they have to in consultation with the experts and the Mm -hmm. researchers because they wouldn't know uh, how to. So once there's some guidelines, we can get some some good training happening and it will happen. It will just it will just take some time. Do you think we'll like Australia will be ready by July 1st? I mean, that's that's pretty quick and just thinking about like how how you know it took like two years to Oregon for develop like their board and then the training stuff got delayed and just also thinking about this bottleneck in like training <clears throat> education you know provide getting people up to speed around this like you know how long should it actually take for a provider to get training right should it be over 100 hours 150 hours 200 hours um yeah, I don't. I, my my answer is no. I don't think so. <laughs> it's just not enough time uh, to yeah. to train yeah. people and just develop, roll out the treatments, the the models. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. Overall, I think it's exciting, um, but I guess we'll watch how it unfolds. And yeah, you know, we're you're also hearing us talk about it from in the psychedelic space. Um, you know, being excited, but also being cautious too. And you know, um, I think we we need to be cautious. These are, are really powerful substances, um, and yeah, we want to see this like uh, do well, right? Um, as I keep bringing up either in our vital classes with students or on the podcast, like, you know, it feels like we're building a scaffolding in the building of psychedelic therapies. But, you know, what about the safety nets and, and what about like the foundations? Because, you know, there will be fallout. Um, and we also need to think about the systems in place <clears throat> where we can catch people. Um, so, you know, we're, we're not having all this like really negative media around it. Right. Um, we're, we're trying to really build something that feels in integrity and alignment and ultimately helping to heal people. Right. Not not harm people. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It needs to be done properly um, with patience and with the with the safeguards yeah yeah but you know also with the mental health crisis and just regular health crisis in general and where we're at like sometimes it does feel like that urgency right it's like oh we need to get this out there to people asap but then when you start to really think about it you go whew yeah there's a lot of hurdles and a lot of different things we need to think about um before that actually happens so yeah i don't know it's it's tricky right it's a kind of it's like this like yeah. dualistic thing you go back and forth you're like yes urgency we need to get this out asap but it's also like let's be really cautious and make sure like people are actually getting good treatment or like, you know, they're, they're, they're doing well and, and they're not kind of spiraling out because of it. Yeah. And I hope that those who mostly need it can access this treatment. Uh, for years, I have worked in residential mental health care, people with very low resources. They have exhausted all options. They've seen many psychiatrists, many psychologists, no, no improvement. So these are people with very, very low income. Um, I wonder, I think that the most they need, I wonder how they're going to access it. Uh, yeah, these groups yeah. will, will push for it. Yeah, hopefully they do. Hopefully they do. All right, we got about like 10 more minutes or so left. Um, <clears throat> and we also just wanted to um, chat a little bit about this this news that you know, just came out yesterday, February 14th. It may have come out on other platforms, but I'm looking at Psychedelic Spotlight. Uh, Vancouver Company creates world's first ever ayahuasca pill. Um, so Filament Health um, is pioneering a breakthrough medical-grade ayahuasca pill. Uh, this novel concept could potentially help individuals access an authentic ayahuasca experience without requiring a trip to South America. And the company is on the brink of obtaining FDA authorization to initiate its pioneering phase one clinical trial uh, for its ayahuasca pill um, with expectations uh, that it will take place during the first six months of 2023. Um, I'm wondering what what were your initial thoughts when you when you saw this article and just this idea of ayahuasca in a pill? I know people have been talking about it for a while, but um, yeah, just kind of curious to hear some of your thoughts. Um, 
initial thoughts were this is not something new. <laughs> I back in my early 20s I experimented with some DMT extraction techniques and that sort of thing. Um, the word pharmawaska was around in those times and what you had to do was to as you extracted DMT for whatever plant source, you turn it into a salt. Um, and then you can put it into a capsule. Do you add the harmaline, the uh, alkaloids, so that it can be active when you take it on a pill? The uh, the idea has been on the underground for a very long time. That's that's yeah. the first thing. <laughs> that's the first thing that came to mind. But like yeah, the underground has been pioneering this area for for decades. Uh, second thought is like, it's amazing if a lot of people can access this treatment. I was like, whenever these new companies develop treatments, I know. Part of the community puts backlash, but I, I think about the results that they'll get and the results is like people will have access to to medicines, to substances. The third thought coming from Colombia, from a South American country, is that a lot of indigenous groups in Colombia, and I imagine in Peru and other countries, say that the ayahuasca or yaje or these mixes are intellectual property of the indigenous mm -hmm. peoples. So how are these biotech companies respecting or paying back or doing some sort of reciprocity to these indigenous cultures? I don't know. I think it will be way too difficult because it's it's a mix that is used all throughout the Amazon. So right. how many different tribes, how many different peoples um, have worked with this? And we know it's a completely different society. They have no protections of pat patents or intellectual properties. Right. Um, I think we just have to acknowledge that. What are the what are these biotechs um, doing to preserve or to help um, the traditional owners and the people who have kept using these medicines for centuries? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm just reading through here. They're saying, um, you know, they, they did bring a, a little bit of this up, right? Like Filament's uh, ayahuasca pill has raised questions concerning previous and informed consent from indigenous organizations for the project, um, as well as allocation of money for sensitive and pressing issues such as the natural species conservation. Um, Benjamin Lightburn has said that the consultations have taken place with uh, relevant local communities in Peru, though the specifics remain confidential until research progresses. Um, but does stress, however, that Filament recognizes that there are many um, competing uh, perspectives on ayahuasca studies, and it's important to take into consideration when dealing with this sacred plant. But yeah, I mean, that's a tough thing. And, you know, the West has been doing that for a while, right? I think about... Um, you know, there's that really popular kind of uh, s story around like some of the anesthetics, like local anesthetics came from, I think it was like one of those poison dart frogs or a tree frog. And wow. Please look this up. Um, but, you know, they found that out and then from, um, you know, the indigenous communities and then, uh, you know, so I don't know if it was ethnobotanists or who came back and then started to isolate that and, you know, turn it into a, an anesthetic that's used medically. Um, and it does bring up like really interesting debates around IP and how do people get like give back especially when these pharmaceutical companies will probably profit um a lot off of this and then those that like you know are the wisdom keepers you know will probably continue to live in poverty and like being taken advantage of and um, yeah. all that stuff so um i don't know it's 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 tricky right because as you're saying it could give access to a lot of people and find healing but on the other hand it's like yeah what about those people where this is actually coming from and they're still kind of continuing to live in a life that may not be so great you know they they need healing and sometimes when i've been in those places where there are retreat centers where there's a lot of local poverty you know i just go wow man like this is really hard even just being here like noticing that and like the privilege of coming in and having a session it's like where's the medicine for some of these people right um yeah and that's it's it's, it's, a, it's a challenge like why does the west get to benefit all the time um but then again, yeah, exactly. you know, like some local communities, maybe they're already doing it. Right. Um, and they just have different expectations around life and success and um, all that. But yeah, I have I have hope uh, in this in the in the in humanity and the psychedelic movement that will take the opportunity to do things differently and to create a new paradigm and a new way of doing things, because I think if we're not going to operate with different values, with a different orientation, I'd say the psychedelic renaissance has failed. Um, 
if we're just yeah. going to follow the exact same patterns as as before yeah that's my that's my view <laughs> Right. I mean, I think a lot of us get involved because we see a different way of being in the world um, and get excited about that and, you know, want to kind of push towards that. And then, yeah, the box comes in and says, nope, you got to stay within these confines. And, um, you know, it's, that's challenging. So how do we continue to maybe push against that um, and, and, you know, really kind of think about what we believe in and try to embody um, you know, some of the, some of those teachings that maybe you've experienced and you're, you're still trying to like figure out how do I show up? How do I embody this? Um, it's a tough balance, right? Because at the end of the day too, you know, you still have to pay rent and like eat food and, and do all those things. And yeah. so it's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Know, I get both sides. Yeah. We'll, we'll keep, we'll keep pushing forwards. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah, this is interesting though. And then, um, you know, I, I know with like the research, it's always an issue around, um, consistency, um, Mm -hmm. and you know, how do you, how do you create a consistent drug effect? And I just find that to be really interesting with psychedelics. Right. And so, you know, psychedelic spotlight, the author here, um, Maria, um, you know, uh, pointing this out, creating a consistent experience. And, And when I was reading that, I think, you know, doesn't that take the magic out of things at times? Right. It doesn't that take like your relationship out of the medicine a little bit where you're just expecting this is the outcome for it versus like, you know, we talk about this often in class. And I think I um, originally picked this up from our colleague and friend Deanna Rogers um, talking about the Western approach to medicine, where it's a very kind of passive approach. You take a medicine, you let the medicine do its job versus like with psychedelics, it, it's more of like this active type of um, process, right? You're engaging with it. You need to like, you know, develop somewhat of a relationship with yourself, with that medicine and then do the work. Right. Um, and you know, I'm sure like you would agree with like the, the, the Graphian perspective, like that non-specific amplifier, right? Exactly. Like we don't know yeah. what's going to come up for folks mm-hmm. and like, we don't know what's going to happen, but you know, I get from like research um, perspectives when you are trying to, to measure it, you do want some consistency. Um, but yeah, I think it's just like an, an interesting thing of the West too. It's just like wanting that where it's like, you know, nothing's consistent in life, <laughs> you know, like everything's constantly changing nothing is really consistent everything's always always moving in in different directions yeah and as we know from you know a psychedelic understanding or depth psychology understanding we're dealing with the unconscious we don't know what's going to come out on high doses we're opening pandora's box so yeah exactly as you say uh difficult to have a predictable consistent experience that just just goes against the whole, <laughs> the, the the whole research and observations that we've had for, yeah. for decades. Yeah, yeah. I think it just kind of like emphasizes our need for control, right? Like just even thinking about some of the, the biotech plays, like wanting to control certain experiences, and I, and I get it from the perspective of like certain health conditions, right? Like being able to create a pill. Um, say from like LSD that doesn't give you the tripping um, aspect, um, the visual aspect, but it cures your 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 headache, right? And it's like great, that that's awesome. But then when it comes to I guess more of the psychological or spiritual approach to, to these medicines of like why you're doing this, um, you know, I think there needs to be a little bit of that unpredictability um, because and I, and I I always come back to um, you know this this uh, thing that I heard during a snowboarding video um, and they were snowboarding out in Alaska and they said, if you feel comfortable out here, you shouldn't be out here. The mountains are alive. And I think the same thing with like these plants and these substances, right? It's like, if we're trying to control it, we're trying to feel comfortable with it. Like, what is that? Right? Like, the, like the natural world is alive. It's always changing. Right. Um, and you know, we need to respect that. It's like, you know, weather patterns up here, like when I just got to Colorado for a little bit, but just watching the weather change, like on a dime like that, it's pretty wild. And you got to respect that. You go, I'm in this natural element and I can't control anything and things are going to change. And I just have to kind of prepare for it. Um, but that's also like a little exciting too, right? Kind of keeps you on your toes. <laughs> I hope it's exciting for people. I think yeah. what you just said alludes to the, what I will describe as the neurotic one of the neurotic aspects of the Western mind where everything needs to be predictable, where everything needs to fit into boxes, 
where there is no spontaneous or like organic, unpredictable experiences. Uh, what if advice if you go in into a high dose psychedelics and you expect to be in control, you're gonna have a not so great time. <laughs> so yeah. we we have to learn surrender. Uh, yeah, just just be with it. go with the flow uh, with nature and just expect the yeah. unexpected. Yep. It's like that old uh, Terrence McKenna quote about nature loves courage. And when you finally find the courage to throw yourself off the, the ledge, you find yourself landing in the feather bed, right? Um, hard to do, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing to do, but... Um, yeah, it's very difficult. I think the 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 Western mind, how it's conditioned, it's, it clings to control and to a linear understanding of things. Um, but in reality, is, is there control? <laughs> we don't, we don't yeah. know. Yeah. Well, Diego, um, I want you to have a little bit of time before heading into class. So, uh, since this is your first time on the podcast, anything you want to like close out with here? Any final thoughts or anything? Well, I hope to, I, hope, I hope to come back, uh, discuss oh, everything that's that that's happening in the field, uh, a bit of history, some interesting, fun experiences. Um, no, thanks a lot for having me. I I love being part of psychedelics today and. Looking forward to this week's class on emotion-focused integration. Uh, that's the topic yeah, for, with for Dr. this week. Adele, Dr. Adela France, amazing, amazing class. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you for thank you, Diego, and um, and thank you everybody t- for listening to this episode of Psychedelics Weekly. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have any questions or anything like that, comments, you can send us an email, info at psychedelicstoday.com. Um, and as we were talking about Vital, we our applications are open until March 19th. So if you're interested in taking the 12-month journey with us um, at Vital, uh, definitely check that out, vitalpsychedelictraining.com. This is a 12-month uh, kind of practitioner training. It's a certificate in psychedelic therapies and integration. So really um, honing in on those skills around harm reduction, preparation, assessment, and then <clears throat> having your own experience at, at a retreat. Um, we actually have a retreat coming up here um, on Sunday um, in Colorado uh, that in- combines breath work um, and some cannabis work. So um, and then we and then we talk about integration. So really um, uh, teaching everybody um, around uh, the importance of edu- uh, integration and uh, integration practice. Practices. And yeah, we were really honored to have Dr. Adela France uh, join us to talk about emotion focused integration, which is just amazing. So, if you're curious and you want to take the plunge with us and take the journey, that's vitalpsychedelictraining.com. Um, and our applications are open until March 19th. Um, and we kick off on April 17th. And then our classes will be weekly every Tuesday from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. So that is it, everybody. I hope everybody's having a wonderful week whenever you're listening to this. And thank you again, Diego. And we'll hopefully have you back on here soon. Thank you you so much. Thank you.